A wise sword saint once said that hesitation is defeat, but the Crucible Knight would beg to differ. The Crucible Knight says fighting me at all is defeat. There are many formidable foes across the lands between that will leave even the most resilient tarnished warrior humbled. You sit by the ephemeral warmth of the long lost grace, allowing the flickering golden light to give you a fleeting respite from the horrors that await you in these hopeless lands. But there are some adversaries that stand out from all the others, creating sudden difficulty spikes for adventurers who grow just a little too bold. When I set out from the stranded graveyard and took my first step into Limgrave, I was prepared for whatever FromSoft could throw at me. I said hello to the Tree Sentinel from a distance. I mastered Margit and climbed the steps to Stormvale Castle. And when I came to the precipice of the high ramparts, I was so confident that I threw myself into the unknown, expecting some secret reward for my daring deed. Instead, I met a giant of bronze, standing tall in a great horned helm, and armour carved with intricate detail, depicting the roots of the primordial crucible. The unwavering knight approached slowly, every step sure and deliberate. What followed was my swift execution. I sat in the rampart tower, licking my wounds. This nameless knight, nestled away on the very fringe of the castle, had hit me thrice as hard as Margit, and that would be the beginning of a trend. I tried everything, but I couldn't so much as stagger him. I read the art of war from back to front, but even with my mind brimming with Chinese proverbs, the Crucible Knight stomped me into the soil. Sun Tzu said, the greatest victory is that which requires no battle. And suddenly, I became enlightened. I left the knight very much alone, and instead, I'm staying within the safety of the sight of grace, writing this video on potentially the most hated enemy in the lands between. Little is known about them, but we do have some really interesting snippets of lore, suggesting that these silent soldiers were among the first Elden Lords elite, and they're as ancient and unfaltering as the Erd Tree itself. Their roots go deep throughout history, back to the primeval Crucible, to a time when all life blended together. It is said the Crucible Knights were so strong that their very appearance was seen as chaotic and deserving of scorn from their enemies. We know these knights served Godfrey, Marika's consort and the first Elden Lord, but their names, powers and garb suggest their legacy stretches back much further than Marika's reign over the lands between. When Marika and her Numans arrived, backed by the Greater Will, order was brought to the lands. Marika became the vessel for the Elden Ring, and the Crucible Tree became the great golden Erd Tree that towers over her new dominion, beaming its incandescent aura down upon its inhabitants. But before her arrival, in the age before the Erd Tree, dragons exercised their supreme power, while fire giants carved out their own civilization in the mountains. And overall, chaos was abundant. In these days, Godfrey was known as Hora Lu, and he was the greatest human warrior to live beneath the canopy of the Crucible Tree. Power is everything in such a brutal realm, especially in the age before order and the ferocious Hora Lu, chieftain of the Badlands, inevitably attracted a significant following. We know that Queen Marika banished Godfrey, and his armies became the legions of Tarnished who would endlessly strive to claim the Elden Throne. But it would seem that the Crucible Knights, as their names suggest, followed Godfrey back when he was called Hora, back when the Erd Tree was called the Crucible of Life. The majestic, rust-coloured armour worn by these knights is said to hold the power of the Crucible of Life, the primordial form of the Erd Tree, and the intricately carved roots are imbued with the ancient magics of the Crucible Tree, for they are said to strengthen aspects of the Crucible incantations. These incantations give us some insight into the chaotic nature of the lands between, before the reign of Queen Marika and the Greater Will. For when you come face to face with a Crucible Knight, you may think their skill with sword and shield is overwhelming enough already. But once they unleash the eldritch powers of the Crucible, resistance becomes utterly futile. The Knights channel their faith and transform. If their aggressive sword strokes and unrelenting shield bashes don't sunder your defences, then these incantations will. They can unfurl dazzling gold wings and swoop down upon you. They may manifest a tail that sweeps the legs out from under you. Or perhaps they'll charge you with a mighty horn, goring you and leaving your entrails scattered across the stones. The strangest ability of all is the breath. 
as if channeling some amphibious creature. Their throats swell with noisome internal gases, and then they spew fire at you, singeing your hair and scorching your flesh. But how do these seemingly human warriors possess such bestial abilities? Well, it is said that these potent incantations are manifestations of the Erdtree's primal vital energies, aspects of the primordial crucible, where all life was once blended together. And this short description tells us a great deal about how chaotic the lands between once were. It's implied that before the rise of Marika, the Golden Order, and the Erdtree, the physical boundaries of biology were far less defined. With the power of the Crucible, warriors could harness the abilities of all living things. Horalu may be a human warrior, but there is no doubt he is far more animalistic than Godfrey, the civilized consort of Queen Marika. It would appear that in the age of the Erdtree, under the Greater Will's tutelage, an attempt was made to solidify what separates one species from another. Through Queen Marika, the Outer God of Order sought to dispel the chaotic elements of the Primordial Crucible that allowed all life to blend together. This serves as a pretty compelling explanation for the disdain Queen Marika and the people living under her rule hold for omens. Omens are individuals born with animal traits, like horns, wings and tails. Once upon a time, these traits were considered blessings, but now omens are reviled, and omen killers are employed to slaughter them. Even the princes Morgoth and Moog, the direct offspring of Queen Marika, were not free from persecution. Whatever ancient power allows for omens to be born in the age of the Erdtree can be channeled by the Crucible Knights, and it's no wonder that Horalu considered them to be his elite soldiers. Among their ranks, two illustrious Crucible Knights stood above the rest. These honoured ones were Ordovis and Siluria. The axe ornamentation seen on most of the knights is the mark of Ordovis. Ordovis dwells within the catacombs of a fallen champion on the outskirts of the royal capital. His greatsword is imbued with an ancient holy essence. Its red tint exemplifies the nature of primordial gold, said to be close in nature to life itself. Siluria is even harder to find, for she stands as a lone sentinel at the foot of the Erdtree, far beneath the earth, in the deep root depths. Siluria's mark is even more prominent than Ordovis's axe. Her knights wear helms adorned with gnarled roots, designed in the fashion of the Crucible Tree. Siluria uses not a sword, but opts for a great spear. Like her helm, sharp roots jut from its haft, which leaves scores of punctured wounds in any sorry soul unfortunate enough to face her. Of all the obstacles a tarnish may overcome on their journey to the base of the Erdtree, few are more cathartic than besting a Crucible Knight in single combat. They were chosen to serve Godfrey for a reason, and they were so strong that their very appearance was seen as chaotic and deserving of scorn from their enemies. So don't be disheartened when they send you back to your grace. Steal yourself once more and never lose your fight. And there you have it. Funnily enough, despite dying often to the Crucible Knights, they were possibly my favourite non-boss enemies to fight. It always felt like a deadly dance, and learning how to evade them was extremely satisfying. What do you think? Do you hate them? Or am I just terrible at Elden Ring and you found them easy to beat? Thanks so much for watching. I've been Drew Mora, and I'll see you in the next one.